so far we have two questions, um, and these are from earlier, so they're, they're both for me, but please do ask questions of the other panelists. Um, I will, um, so I'll do the first one. Today's talk on genomic diversity are biased toward US-based speakers and US-centric examples. What are some of the worldwide issues that we are missing? Um, and I'll just briefly comment on it and then see if the other uh, panelists have um, other things that they'd like to add to it. But um, I think that this is a really important question and it's, it's an open question uh, that we probably don't have the full, uh, the full answer and the full understanding of. And I think this is one of the key reasons, what, some of the key work that the uh, equity, Di diversity and inclusion group uh, has before them in ensuring that we have a more inclusive in community, that we have the breadth of community to get to what are those worldwide issues um, that we may be missing today. Um, any other comments from the other panelists? Okay, uh, the next question is, um, also for me, is there value in reaching out to other initiatives in genomics or biotechnology? For example, IC, ISCB now has an equity, diversity, diversity and inclusion committee. Um, there is absolutely value in reaching out to others. Um, I think um, everyone is in the process of understanding what, what it means for their communities to be inclusive. And so um, one of the things that the EDI group has been doing is collecting um, information about other groups that have EDI um, communities uh, or, or uh, policies um, and groups and, and connecting with them and also collecting um, their policies and um, other information, other artifacts from the work that they're doing. So um, we are we are doing that, and I, there's definitely value in it. So thank you for this for that comment. All right, we're looking for more questions. So I'll ask a question. Um, so you both talked about some aspects of trust and the the importance of um of using uh data in a um in a transparent way um what do you feel like are some of the um some of the challenges that we would face if um if we continue down this road of potentially having non-transparent ways of sharing data So I think that one of the issues or one continued issue is that certain communities already have a low level of trust related to particularly health and genomics because of experience. And that's a very valid thing for them to distrust um, health and healthcare care um, because of history, because of how they have been treated and historically have been treated and continue to be treated. So I think lack of transparency will continue to edify um, distrust in a system that um, hasn't historically been you know good to them at the same time um, some people are attempting to improve right so whether it's thinking about how to better treat um, certain diseases or to um, better involve patients in the healthcare process. If patients aren't there to be involved, then that kind of hampers those kinds of initiatives. But lack of transparency only further hinders that because um, it's easy for people to say that, I, you know, I just don't understand or don't know what exactly you're using this for, or I don't understand all of the implications of your use, of your collection of this, and therefore to continue to distrust um, the, the healthcare provider and the healthcare system. Excellent point. Um, Amel, there's a question for you here. Uh, how can researchers help to bridge the gap between the study and the studied? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think working more on um, designing uh, community uh, involvement um, efforts uh, by communicating objectives of um, data collections, where we're collecting data, how it's going to be used, what are we studying, like basically explaining science in a very simple way to uh, different populations could be very helpful. Um, but it is also very important to explain results uh, once this study uh, is done. There are a few um, factors that have been put in place by HRA Africa, for example. One of them is the, the truth uh, framework based on uh, the Ubuntu South African uh, principle, where basically um, community uh, members are involved from the very beginning and they have, uh, like the researchers uh, do have uh, people who are from some specific tribes or some uh, specific areas who are involved in explaining uh, science to, to these communities. I think that helps uh, bridging the gap. And in some ways a related question, oh no, they bounced around. Um, a, a, a related question, so I'm going to take this one first. How do we develop trustworthiness when we ourselves, researchers, don't understand all of the uh, implications of our work? Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. I think it's important to be transparent about not knowing all the implications as well. Um, it, you know, you know it, it is heartening to people to be in a discussion with researchers and them saying, we don't know everything. That both humanizes the researcher, but it allows them to form trust and have a ongoing dialogue with the people participating and the researchers. But I would also say that it's incumbent upon researchers, all of us, to um, have a, a broad imaginary of what can happen in connection to data, um, both the super positive things that we really want, but also the horrible, terrible, negative things that could possibly happen to then ensure we build in protections in connection to those really disparate negative impacts that could possibly happen. And related to that, Amel, you, you talked a little bit about the design of these studies. How does that play a role in this? Yeah, um, I think it's really important to have people from uh, different backgrounds, people who understand uh, the problem from very different perspectives and each can bring an additional uh, thing to pay attention for to the table. Um, that's how we can sort of ensure that at least we're doing our best to sort of uh, understand uh, and design uh, models, systems, data analysis plan that takes into consideration uh, the different um, problems or the different characteristics of a certain uh, population or data set we're, uh, we're studying. Um, and I can like share a few examples, like I'm a, I'm a computer scientist myself and in the beginning when I started doing bioinformatics, I was basically handling data sets as, you know, genes that, as X and Y is without really understanding that. Uh, but now there are more and more efforts in um, including uh, some, um, um, raising awareness about the importance of thinking about what personal data is, how we should uh, handle personal data, how we should protect personal data. So I think um, reinforcing um, teaching different disciplines and having people understand different perspectives is also very important. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, how do we integrate the different dimensions to building trust, including policy, society, uh, societal, and technical components? Yeah, I would, I mean, I would uh, repeat myself and say basically, uh, 
having multidisciplinary teams and uh, diverse teams that are all involved in, in the discussion uh, from the very beginning, identifying needs and how we're going to, to answer a certain uh, question and uh, evaluation, uh, evaluating and communicating results as well, like having people involved throughout the whole process. All right, the next question is, can you comment on the SHRM-2 decision to restrict the transfer of data between countries? In your opinion, will this support or hinder diversity in research? So I think I, I have a different perspective. So it's not so much about supporting or hindering diversity in research, but protecting um, data subjects, so to speak, from the possible harms from a region or a country or whatever that doesn't have um, the standards that are, are set to ensure um, that harms are mitigated from data transfers and the use of data. Um, can it possibly hinder diversity in research? Sure, if, if um, there's a significant amount of data that comes from a country that doesn't meet the standards. At the same time, it can push that country to do something to meet those standards, whether that's passing legislation um, and, and having requirements. Um, but I think the more important part of this, of the SHRIMS 2 decision, is that it is a decision that says that we think certain standards are really important with respect to mitigating certain kinds of harm, or the possibility of certain kinds of harms um, related to data um, and, and who's represented in the data. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is about tools and resources. Um, can you recommend some resources for tools, tool developers to learn more about the ways that uh, the way these limit trust and how we can make those tools more trustworthy. And I will also extend that to talk about um, uh, the, you talked a lot about a human centric design, maybe also um, if you have resources for that. Yeah, um, I'm going to share a couple of resources um, in the chat box, but I've been involved in uh, a WHO effort thinking about um, sort of guidelines for developers uh, designing AI for health. Um, I think we didn't find that there's one that is quite comprehensive and applicable to all settings, including low and middle income countries. Um, so that's going to be public by the end of the year, hopefully. Um, but I'm also going to share a couple of resources um, in the chat box. Um, yeah. Great, thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to take this one. Um, people as infrastructure is interesting. Can we talk about interoperability between computers without thinking about how people interact? Does that connect? I think it does connect. Um, so thinking about people as infrastructure, the idea is that um, people fill in the gaps where other structures fail. So whether that's governments, civil society, or other um, supposed to be working things, and people fill in those gaps by doing whatever it is they're doing. So we think about then interoperability between computers or computer systems and data transfers. Think about the amount of labor a researcher or person in general has to use to make things work when the systems aren't exactly interoperable. Um, definitely need to think about how people interact both with each other and the system and how systems work with each other. Sure. Okay. Um, as team leaders in biomedical research, how should we prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion in our teams relative to the subjects of the data we handle? Uh, 
Um, um, I'll answer that. Um, I think when working in on international uh, projects, and I'll take examples from um, some Eastern Africa uh, projects, where basically, um, whenever um, we're doing a specific analysis related to um, one of the Eastern Africa projects. Um, the bioinformatics uh, research group leaders always brought um, researchers from these specific countries to be involved in the analysis. And we also designed a sort of internship systems um, as part of HRA Bionet, where we allowed researchers to move from one institute to the other where the analysis is being done or um, or uh, bring these researchers um, to a specific um, institutions and institution in South Africa, Tunisia, wherever, and sort of teach them the skills and then allow them to get back to their communities and um, and transfer what they learned and um, con contribute in uh, teaching other people in their institutions, we'll be able to, uh, to be part of uh, the analysis later on. Um, as part of HFNet, we also done a lot of uh, bring your own data and come to a training. Uh, we've done that in collaboration with the Pasteur Institutes Network, uh, where we basically brought uh, students or uh, postdocs from across the continent. They bring their own data. Uh, we spend a whole week uh, uh, lectures and then the second week they have the chance to work on their own data while um, they're supported by different uh, instructors. Um, but I think um, in general um, it's great to have people from different backgrounds uh, working together on a, um, an analysis. That makes sense. Thank you. And the last question we have here is, how do you balance the risk of harm with the risk of not fully leveraging data being collected by the global community through responsible sharing? Um, I can attempt to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so the risk of harm um, is not some kind of abstract thing, we've seen harms that have happened with respect to data collection um, and use by various kinds of firms, um, governments and organizations. And we also seen the possibilities uh, and the possible negative implications happening with the use of collected data. Um, while we want to have great health outcomes and great achievements with respect to the curing of diseases or new treatments. It is also important that people's lives that we want to improve, that while they're also living their lives in general, that they're not being harmed from data and data use. It's not that researchers themselves are always the negative users, but the fact of the matter is that data can be used by many different kinds of organizations and people, and not all of them for the positive purposes for which um, many of us would want genomic data, for example, or health data to be used. And that's a really important consideration to have. Um, and balancing the, that um, risk of harm with not having collected all that data I guess the major question is, do you need all of the data that you collect? Are there certain kinds of data that you don't need, that you usually collect, but you don't actually need? Are there certain kinds of connection points with, with, it, with respect to data that are made, but that don't need to be made? How can we uh, make data collection as safe, as lower risk as possible, so that we don't create harms while trying to mitigate other harms um, for, for public good or in the public interest. Great. So that concludes our, our panel. Thank you so much to Jasmine, Emile, and Kimentri.